Wow, part three, you actually made it. Nice. So this video isn't going to be super mathematical like the previous ones. I'm just going to be talking very generally about these concepts. Not because it's hard, but honestly, I'm actually very out of my depth here. We're at the research level of maths now, and the details are beyond my understanding. So, you know, I'll try my best, but take what I say with a grain of salt. And check the comments below. Someone will probably correct me on something. If you look up wheel theory on Wikipedia, this is what it says. It gives a formal definition of the wheel, and lists some of the basic properties that we saw in part 2. And then there's this section, the wheel of fractions. Let A be a commutative ring, and let S be a submonoid of A. Define the congruence relation tilde S on A by A via- Okay, what the hell am I reading? This is complete gibberish! Don't worry, I'm not going to go into this technical math speak. All that matters is this is like a formula, or an algorithm, that allows us to generate different wheel algebras. For example, the wheel algebra we created in part 2 was the special case where A was the set of integers, and S was the set of integers except 0. But we can do it with different sets, of course, and then we get different wheels. I can't tell you what they are, but I can show you. Remember the visual diagram that we created in part 2? Let's bring that back, and let's zoom out to get a bigger picture. With this, we can visualize the structure of our wheel. Alright, oh by the way, quick side note, there's an interesting kind of geometry going on in this picture. Each point here represents a fraction, and the sum of two fractions is another fraction, so we could define an addition on these points in the same way. Like if I add these two blue points together, then we get this green point. And as I move them around, it changes. But it's not obvious how. Sometimes the green point moves by a lot. Sometimes only by a little. Sometimes it doesn't move at all. I don't know. Haven't really looked into it. Maybe I will in a future video. Anyway. Back to wheel algebra. A is the set of integers. S is the set of integers without zero. So what happens if we change S to be... I don't know, a single number one. Oh, the lines have all disappeared. All the fractions have become their own separate little islands. Okay, what if I change s to the set negative one, one? Uh, oh, each point is connected to its negative. Yeah. Oh hey, that kind of makes sense. s equals negative one, one. What else? In this one, I've made s the powers of 2. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. And that causes each point to connect to the one twice as far away, and also the one 4 times as far away, and the one 8 times as far away, and 16 times as far, and so on. Okay, enough of s now. What about if we change a instead? Yeah, we can do that. Let's make a the real numbers instead. Oh no, what have I done? Nah, there's nothing wrong here. We simply converted our integer lattice into a lattice of real numbers. And the real numbers are dense. That's why the whole plane is now red. The lines and points are still in there, they're just all squished together into one big area. Except for zero, 00 in the middle, of course. The black hole number must be sealed off at all times. This particular wheel is probably better than our original one, I think. Because with this one, we can divide any real number by zero, instead of, you know, only the rational numbers. So those are some of the different types of wheels. One thing that Wikipedia does not mention, though, is the wheel of fractions does not cover all of the possible wheel algebras. There are wheels that go beyond all of this still. But I don't know what they are. Don't think anyone does. It's an unsolved problem. In fact, I could only find a single paper online that actually went into any real detail about it. 48 pages. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said it's just one guy somewhere. His name is Jesper Karlstrom. This dude. <laughs> what a legend. If you're watching this, Jesper, hello, congratulations, you made it on YouTube. Hooray. <sighs> Enough about wheels. 
I want to end this deep dive in true Red Beanie Mass fashion, with a rant. Because there's something people always get wrong when talking about Division by Zero, and it grinds my gears. LIMITS! The limit as x approaches 0 from the right equals infinity, but the limit as x approaches 0 from the left equals negative infinity. Ha ha! That's why we can't divide by 0. Yeah, limits! Ah, oh, no! Wrong! Ugh, division by 0 has nothing, nothing to do with limits. Yes, the limit on the left is different to the limit on the right. But these limits only tell us about the function's behaviour near 0. Okay? Near zero, not at zero. And the function's behavior near zero need nothing to do with its value at zero. Unless, and this is the big mistake, we assume continuity. If we assume division is continuous at zero, then yes, okay, it makes sense. But who said division should be a continuous function? There is no reason to assume that at all. Well, okay, fine, I guess continuity is always a nice thing to have, and therefore we would certainly prefer if division was continuous. But to assume it? My god! What are we? Engineers? Disgusting. So, if you see someone saying this on YouTube comments, or Reddit, or Twitter, or wherever, you have my permission to link them this video and humiliate them in front of everyone! They will be forced to delete their account! and retreat into the shadows forever in shame. And everyone will cheer, and we shall be heroes! Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. Bye.